Good morning and uh, welcome to the Central Region Science Sharing uh, Seminar Series. Uh, today's topic will be application of zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors and the latest in QLCS conceptual models uh, given by Ron Przybylinski and Jason Schaumann from uh, WFO St. Louis for Ron and WFO Springfield for Jason. Uh, Ron, uh, it's all yours. Ron, can we hear you? Recording uh, this for posterity. And uh, okay, is Jason, is Jason uh, on the line too. I am yes. here, Ron. Yes, he okay. is there. I just want to once again welcome everybody to the Central Region Science Sharing Series. And today uh, we have Ron Przybylinski from uh, WFO St. Louis and Jason Chowman from WFO Springfield on the line. And they'll be giving a presentation on the application of zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors and the latest in QLCS conceptual models. Uh, Ron, uh, it's all yours. Well, uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it very much. Um, you know, Jason and I have been kind of working in uh, a couple areas right here, and one of them is, is application of zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors. I know there are a few students out there also looking at this. Um, uh, and it's good to see that there's others who's uh, trying to apply this application, not only to forecasting, but also applying uh, this uh, application to over uh, overlaid over reflectivity. And I think uh, I'll let Jason do more discussion on this. Okay, uh, okay, uh, John, next. John, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Next slide. I did. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So the outline of this presentation, uh, again, we're going to focus on the application of the zero three kilometer bulk shear vector and forecasting QLCS scenario potential. And also, uh, we're going to be identifying, using this application, identify regions of QLCS scenario genesis in real time. And I'm going to introduce some of the latest conceptual model thinking out there. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Nolan Atkins quite a bit over the years, and Nolan and I um, converse quite a bit back and forth each month, and, sh and just on discussions of how we can further improve the actual further conceptual models that were produced back in the oh, middle of two thousand, uh, middle of the two thousand, uh, two thousand five, two thousand six timeframe. And in this presentation, I'm not going to cover everything it's gonna if I did that it'd probably be about a ten hour presentation. It'd just be too long. So we're just gonna focus on the late night, early morning book or cases in this presentation. And here in St. Louis and R C W A and I believe probably in other adjacent CWAs around me and places further east, we find this to be a challenging situation when we see a rapidly moving convective line uh, traveling across Missouri, Illinois. Kentucky, Indiana, was, uh, and so forth, or maybe it can happen across the Southern Great Lakes region as well. So, uh, like I said, we want to focus on this part here, and we got uh, three different examples, and uh, like I say, we'll go into that. 
So at this point, I'm going to pass my baton over to Jason Schumann. Thanks, Ron. As Ron already mentioned, I'm uh, going to heavily focus on the, the shear cold pool balance uh, part of the 0 to 3 kilometer shear vectors. One thing I want to point out, the reason we use generally use 0 to 3 kilometer shear vectors and bulk shear vectors at that is we're trying to simulate the depth of a, a typical cold pool from an MCS. Not, they're not always 3 kilometers deep. Some may be 2.5 kilometers to 2 kilometers, but we've found that uh, 0 to 3 kilometer shear works best. Um, a lot of the research in the past is also focused on zero to three kilometer magnitudes. But what we found, and not only the three cases we're going to present today, but many other cases, is that the line normal component of that mag magnitude is critical. Uh, we'll also briefly hit on um, a three, each of these cases, the, uh, the stratiform precipitation regions. Uh, one caveat to all of these cases, uh, we're making a lot of assumptions here. You know, we could spend hours showing near storm environments, synoptic setups, et cetera, et cetera. But we're assuming the environment's going to be pretty supportive of tornado potential. Uh, you got sufficient instability, uh, convection is near surface based, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, go to the next slide, please. Again, your 0 to 3 kilometer shear is crucial to determining the shear cold pool balance of an MCS. It's, it's really one half of the equation. Uh, you've got the uh, environmental shear side of the equation. You've also got the cold pool side of the equation. We're going to look at that a little bit more in depth shortly. Uh, I will say that observations and model simulations have also shown that mesovortex development tends to increase with increasing amounts of 0 to 3 kilometer shear. Again, a lot of the research in the past has been focused more on the magnitudes, but uh, we're going to be looking a little heavier into the, the line normal components of this. Uh, go ahead. Looks like you already advanced the slide there. Uh, Mesovortex genesis is definitely favored in regions of shear cold pool balance or slightly shear dominant shear cold pool balance regimes. Uh, again, as, as already pointed out, uh, large line normal components of 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear also favor mesovortex genesis. And what we found operationally is those line normal magnitudes, 15 meters per second or greater or so, uh, support increased mesovortex genesis and tornado potential. Now, some of the numerical simulations out there have actually shown slighter, uh, slightly less values, but again, operationally, 30 knots or so seems to be uh, very supportive of, of increased mesovortex genesis. Now, the thing I will point out here is that it's very rare to get tornado genesis with cold pool dominant systems. Uh, you, can, you can get your quick spin-ups or so, but with your cold pool dominant systems, typically your outflow is outrunning uh, the MCS, so very rarely going to see tornado genesis there. Looks like you've already forwarded on to the, the first case study here, which, quite honestly, we could spend hours talking about this one. I uh, wish I could present a lot more here in terms of the, the near-storm environment, the mesoscale setup, but it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. But as this loop hopefully continues to load here, uh, a couple things to point out here. First off, and you'll see this in a couple slides here, had a very large swath of straight-line wind damage. Uh, with this, this super derecho that, that came across southwest Missouri this day. Uh, a lot of that wind damage, if this animation gets going here, was associated or very close to the northern bookend vortex. Uh, we also had several tornadoes that day, and, and we'll, we'll show a map here of our surveys, which, which took us three or four days to complete here, just given the massive magnitude of this event. But not sure if you all are seeing the animation, but that bookend vortex, uh, generally tracks just north of Joplin there, just the north of Springfield area, kind of in an east-southeast fashion, uh, while the apex of that bow uh, tracks over just north of Joplin, uh, very close to the Springfield metropolitan area there, and continues on to the east-southeast uh, into portions of south-central Missouri. And this is an event that affected multiple CWAs, including St. Louis, Paducah, started off in Wichita's area. Uh, if you advance to the next slide. Uh, 
I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on, on this slide here. Uh, there's a lot going on here. I'm sure many of you all have seen these, these, these schematics. Uh, I believe they were presented in one of the common courses, actually, an MCS maintenance. But uh, what we've got three, there is illustrated as uh, three differing shear cold pool regimes. Uh, I think that the easy, easiest way to conceptualize this is to pretend there's a line of storms moving from left to right across these images uh, or west to east. Uh, your, your blue shading there is going to be your cold pool. Uh, you, you've also got the arrows present there, and those are actually uh, simulating 2D wind fields uh, vertically in the atmosphere. But starting off with the, the shear dominant regime there at the top, uh, first thing to point out there in the right, right half of the imager, so you'll notice the clockwise rotation uh, to the arrows there, kind of a horizontal rotor, if you will. That's basically simula simulating your, your environmental shear. Uh, you can imagine uh, speed shear or shear increasing with height uh, throughout the atmosphere. It's actually causing a, a horizontal rotor in a clockwise fashion there in that schematic. You move to the cold pool side there. While it's not as evident in the shear dominant case, uh, you're actually getting a counterclockwise rotor as that cold pool begins to spread out there from the MCS. Now, a lot of times in these shear dominant cases, you'll get a, a thinner line of convection that tends to lean forward. And in many cases with the shear dominant uh, setup, especially in the cold season, that you, you will get the leading stratiform precipitation as that precipitation is carried down shear. Uh, moving on to the nearly balanced regime there in the middle, again, you, you can see your, your horizontal rotor, your, your clockwise rotor there to the right of the cold pool. You can kind of begin to make out there the counterclockwise rotor uh, with the cold pool spreading out there uh, from the MCS. But interestingly, in this case here, uh, look at what your updraft's doing there. Uh, you've got a much greater vertical extent there, nearly upright. And then that's very critical. Uh, typically, with your balanced balance, uh, regime, you're going to get more in the way of severe weather. That's, that's the regime you, you really want to look for for severe weather potential. Not just talking straight line wind potential here. We're talking mesovortex potential also. You really want that line to be near balanced. I, I will point out uh, with the shear dominant regime, you can also get tornadoes with that. If you really think about it, you're talking about a highly sheared environment anyway. So that, that can also either favor mesovortex tornadoes, but then if you get tornadoes developing in your, your balance regime, sometimes they'll shift off into that shear dominant regime. So you, you can get sustained tornado potential in, in both of those regimes. Now, typically, once you moved into the balance regime, you're going to get more of your trailing stratiform precipitation. Uh, finally, moving into the cold pool dominant regime, you'll notice your horizontal rotor for the environmental shear has nearly disappeared there. Uh, you can definitely make out a, a counterclockwise rotor there to the cold pool as it spreads out. But again, as we mentioned earlier, a, a lot of times what will happen is that cold pool in the cold pool dominant regime will tend to outrun your, your main convection there. The, a lot of your updrafts in, the, in that scenario, they're going to lean rearward, uh, much less in the way of a, a severe weather threat with that. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is one image. We just had a slide in there. Um, the, the label on this is correct. This was actually taken at 12Z, the KSGF RAB there. Just, just an incredible sounding for 12Z. A couple things that really stick out there, A, is the, is the lack of inhibition. Uh, you, if you lifted an ML parcel there, there is really no inhibition which is pretty phenomenal for 12Z there in the morning. But you also notice those massive amounts of ML cape there, right around 3,600 or so. Now, one, one general rule of thumb I tend to use when, when trying to forecast a forward-propagating mesoscale convective system is you want mu capes uh, right around 2,500 or greater. So, and as you can see in this case, even though this is ML capes, you easily exceeded that 2,500 threshold threshold for the capes. One other thing to point out with this sounding, too, is the theta E differential that was present. Uh, this is taken uh, 
with using a parcel from just above the surface up to a minima. Generally look up around 700 millibars, maybe as high as 650 millibars or so. But when you get theta E differentials between a near surface parcel and around 700 millibars or so, greater than 25, you're really talking about some pretty good cold pull potential. You start pushing 30, you're starting to get in some excellent cold pull potential. Anything above 30, it's rocking. So it, very, uh, very good cold pool potential this day. Again, I already pointed out the capes. Those are two main ingredients to really look for in the potential for a forward propagating MCF. One thing I'll point out also about models this day, did a very poor job capturing the sheer amount of instability there. Just very poor, way, way underestimated. It didn't too, do too bad with the kinema kinematic fields, but instability, they were basically useless. Uh, already advanced to the next slide, it looks like. Uh, got a four panel here, kind of the evolution of this super derecho from about 1230Z to about 14Z. And um, John, I don't know if you're the one driving there, but this, this one's got some, some animations in there I'll have you advance through here. This, this actual slide does. But uh, as you can see here, uh, this, this super derecho, could you go back one? Mm-hmm. That, that's kind of the tricky part there. Okay, um, the, the super duratio advances to the east-southeast with time. Uh, what we've got highlighted there is the actual balance region of this line. Uh, especially looking at the bottom two panels there, you'll notice uh, with the highlighted balance region there are a couple of things. First of all, that's that's where, and this is the actually the half degree reflectivity, but that's where your most vigorous convection updraft appears to be, at least looking at the half degree slice. But you'll also notice that the precipitation, the stratiform precipitation region there at the apex is actually trailing the line. Another thing to focus in on, really with the whole line here, we've got overlaid there the zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors. You'll notice the magnitudes on those are anywhere between 45 and even 55 knots in some cases. Now, you look at the northern portion of that line where those things are nearly normal to the line, it would take one heck of a cold pull to actually balance out that environmental shear. And as, as you'll see here in later slides, that, that environmental shear was actually enhanced most likely by uh, developing powerful bookend vortex, well, the strongest one I've ever seen personally. But when you talk about cold pull balancing 45 to 55 knots environmental shear, it's nearly impossible. You're talking about cold pool pressure rises pushing 10 millibars. So I've, I've personally, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. So you actually needed an angle of the zero to three kilometer shear vectors to that line for there to be balance there. So very interesting case from that standpoint. Uh, you can go ahead and move to the next, there you go, the, the shear dominant portion of the line. You notice that it actually expanded at time uh, expanded what time was that apex of that bow tended to move off to the east southeast uh, again just too much environmental shear there uh, for the cold pool to balance that out um, one thing I'm going to point out with the, the shear dominant portion of the line is you had a, a ton of leading stratiform precipitation there not only leading stratiform precipitation but you look at those especially those bottom two panels there are closer to 1400z you had 50 plus DVZs of, of leading stratiform precipitation. Again, that's that's a very rare thing. See that much leading stratiform and that intensive leading stratiform, and that that did create some challenges for radar operators that day. Uh, if you get advance to the next animation, there we go. The cold pool dominant portion of the line um, again tended to grow with time as you got in the northwest Arkansas there. Uh, Obviously, the convection is not nearly as robust down there. Uh, your outflow was tending to outrun the convection there. You look at your zero to three kilometer shear vectors. Uh, you get down to that northern or that southern portion of the line. You'll notice they're darn near parallel to that thing. So, very little contribution from environmental zero to three kilometer shear down in that portion of the the super duratio, and that allowed that outflow to out to outrun the storms there. Going back to the last slide here, again, you're looking for mesovortex potential in your balanced or slightly shear dominant region. So that's basically from the apex on north for this, this given system. 
again, also, you're looking for that 30 knot or so threshold of line normal, uh, the line normal component of the bulk shear. So even in the balanced region with that, you know, we'll call it a 45 degree angle or so, uh, you still had plenty there, line normal component, probably 35 or 40 knots or so, uh, easily enough there for mesovortex genesis in the balanced region. So very unique case, uh, one of the, just one of the many unique facets of this case. You had all three shear, uh, cold pool shear balance regimes present, not only at the same time, but for two to three hours as this moved across uh, the Missouri Ozarks region. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, moving along to 1307Z here, as, as uh, the line is actually moving through the Springfield metropolitan area, a couple of things to draw in here. First of all, uh, quite an impressive uh, rear inflow jet is surging east there uh, towards the Highway 65 corridor, which runs between Springfield and Branson. Again, look at those zero to three kilometer shear vectors talking 50 to 55 knots or so, starting to be enhanced by the bookend vortex developing up north of Springfield. Very, very close to line normal in the sheared region up to the north of Springfield there, the, the sheared dominant region, I should say. Had the angle there in the balanced region, but again, plenty of magnitude, line normal magnitude there for mesovortex genesis. Um, one other thing to point out, if you look at the updraft, downdraft convergence zone here, and this, this is critical, you kind of follow that down from the Springfield RDA there, down towards the, the Reed Spring area there, and then it curls back to just south, south of Shell Knob. Very smooth, uh, very smooth updraft, downdraft convergence zone at this point. Uh, you'll notice there we're starting to get one mesovortex uh, beginning to develop there to the north of Reed Spring. Notice that mesovortex is, A, developing on the updraft downdraft convergence zone, but it's also developing on the leading edge of the convection. As we'll see here in the next slide, that's not necessarily going to remain the case for this specific uh, mesovortex. Uh, could you go ahead and advance, please? A lot of things going on in this slide here. Uh, first thing to point out is we continued to get mesovortex genesis in the nearly balanced portion of the line as it moves very close uh, through the Branson area up towards Taneyville there. You'll notice that mesovortex 1 has now propagated north along the updraft downdraft convergence zone. But look at the placement of that mesovortex when it comes to the stratiform precipitation field. It's actually migrated towards the back of the most intense leading stratiform precipitation. Again, that, that was very challenging for radar operators that day. A lot of times we'll teach in storm spot or safety training, the worst is first. That was not the case as you got into that sheer dominant region. Uh, and in this case, that would be from Taneyville all the way up towards the bookend vortex around Aldrich there. Very impressive presentation there. You'll notice we've got mesovortex 2 that's already developing there and a third mesovortex that's beginning to develop there in the balanced region. Again, got a lot of your trailing, uh, trailing stratiform precipitation in the balanced region and then also the cold pool dominant region where the outflow continues to outrun it, southern portion of the line there. Uh, could you go back one slide, please? There's one, one, there you go. One more thing I wanted to point out there. Notice the updraft, downdraft convergence zone, the wavy appearance it's beginning to take on. Very smooth before, but really now starting to take on a wavy appearance. As you went out a half hour, 45 minutes beyond this time, it continued to get even wavier. And one thing we really started to see is as these mesovortices moved into the leading stratiform area, they really redistributed the intense leading stratiform precipitation back to the west. And it, it was a very unique appearance on radar. You, you saw a lot of these curly Q hook-like uh, appendages to these mesovortices. 
A lot of times you don't have that intense leading stratiform. So you're talking about redistributing 50 to 60 dBZ reflectivities back to the west. Uh, very unique appearance to those. Uh, finally, one more thing to point out. Party already seen it there. Just an incredible bookend vortex signature up to the north there. 100 knot plus velocities or so just above the ground. Uh, again, I mentioned the, the wide swath of wind damage there as, as we started looking at this case study. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Not sure how many of you all have seen that the VR traces. Uh, Ron, the St. Louis office, just does some wonderful work with these. These are very telling. Uh, basically what these are is uh, it's a plot of radiation or uh, rotational velocities, excuse me, uh, with height. You'll notice there in the, in the left schematic, uh, with height, then also you're kind of just going out in time with volume scans on the, the, the horizontal axis there. And you'll notice on that left schematic there, as you got to around 13, 16 or so, once you start getting around that 20 meters per second threshold, it actually offered quite a bit of lead time, especially when it comes to mesovortex tornadoes. Offered quite a bit of lead time for tornado genesis there, which you see started right around 1324 there with mesovortex 2. You'll notice also just prior to tornado genesis, the rapid strengthening of the mesovortex, especially in the one and a half to two and a half kilometer layer to where you're talking rotational velocities now right around or greater than 30 meters per second, which is quite impressive in terms of mesovortex strength. Uh, shifting to the, the right graphic there, uh, what this is a plot of is your core diameters, again, with time. And what's interesting about the, this specific mesovortex is, again, where you had the, the maxima, if you will, between the one and a half, two and a half kilometer layer AGL, you'll notice those core diameters really decreased right before tornado genesis. So, uh, th this is something we've seen quite often uh, just prior to tornado genesis, the rapid strengthening of the mesovortex, and then also the core diameter decreasing. And in this specific case, your actual maximum did not come down necessarily to the, the 0.5 till. It actually remained up there a little bit uh, in the one, one and a half, two and a half kilometer layer. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, and this was indeed the damage assessment, which again, took quite a while with this case. You'll notice a very wide swath of 70 to 90 mile an hour winds from uh, far southeastern Kansas there, uh, just kind of almost bisected our CWA. Uh, Notice also all the tornado tracks there had 20 tornadoes that day, uh, including six EF2s, one EF3 tornado. Notice most of the tracks there are actually from southwest to northeast, but interestingly, there are a few traps or uh, tracks that are almost from south to north up there. Uh, we believe that was uh, had a lot to do with the, the track of that bookend vortex with a lot of those, those spin-ups occurring along the leading edge of the line there, probably in the leading stratiform region and just shooting from south to north. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. This one's probably going to be pretty intensive, so this one may take a while to load. This is a pretty long event here as we move into case study two, applying the zero to three shoe vectors. But what we're gonna mainly be focusing in on as this continues to load is a, a forward propagating MCS that, that starts to develop in the eastern portions of the, of the Wichita CWA, really gets its act together, uh, really close to the state line, just, just under the Missouri side there, and uh, fairly rapidly moves to the east, just to the north of the Springfield metropolitan area. Not sure it's going to get much better than this. Uh, just take my word for the animation. I'm not, not sure if you all are seeing that, but again, focusing on the MCS that tracks just to the north of the Springfield area. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, hit a little bit more of the near storm environment with this one and also the synoptic setup. Um, 
had some mid and upper level uh, shortwave trough, uh, and some energy coming in from the High Plains region early on the evening of uh, June 19, 2011 there. You can see, especially as you get from mid to late June, uh, the westerlies weren't too bad there in this specific case. You're talking about 40 to maybe 50 knots or so of 500 millibar flow uh, coming at us from the west. Next slide, please. Uh, this is going to be your 850 plot again from 0Z that evening. A couple of things to point out here. Uh, some very rich moisture was present or present at the 850 layer there. Uh, dew points may be hard to see there, but in the shaded area there, you're looking at 14 to 16 uh, degrees Celsius or so of dew points. One other thing to point out, uh, you, you had a low-level jet that was beginning to develop from the western Gulf, poking on into uh, southeastern Kansas, far west central Missouri. As you would expect, given climatology, this thing was just starting to ramp up at zero Z. As you got closer to three and four Z or so, what you're seeing is 20 to 25 knots poking into western Missouri. That was actually closer to 40 or 45 knots once you got to about the four Z time frame or so. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the, uh, the KSGF RAOP from that evening. Uh, again, very very impressive amounts of instability, just as we saw with the super duration show there. Uh, probably some evidence of an elevated mix layer there, given some nearly dry adiabatic lapse rates. Uh, and the drop off in, in, in moisture there, just above 700 millibars bars or so. But ML Cape Valley is over 4,400 or so. Mu Cape Valley is over 5,500. While instabilities were forecast to drop off that evening, uh, they were still going to remain uh, well above that that 2,500 threshold or so we like to look at uh, for potential for forward propagating MCSs. You notice the shear also, your larger scale shear, you had effective 0 to 6 kilometer, or effective bulk shear, 36 knots or so. Uh, surface to 3 kilometer shear, 34 knots, so definitely supportive of organized convec convection. The one thing that really stands out with this sounding is your, your theta E difference that we talked about earlier. And this, this was pulled off of SPC's page there. I believe they use N sharp to generate these graphics. And from what I hear, that's actually going to be in AOPS too. Looking forward to that. But uh, if you look at the graphic there, kind of the, the right center portion of, of this, this sounding, you notice the TEI plot there. I believe that stands for theta E index. And what we're looking at there uh, is theta E's as you go up in the atmosphere. You'll notice down near the surface, very rich theta E's present. Those substantially drop off as you get up towards 700 millibars or so. And again, you're looking at differentials there right around 40, 40, 40 Kelvin or so. That's just incredible. I, you know, I talked about 30, 30 being a, a solid threshold for very strong cold pool potential before. Now we're up around 40. Plus, you got the incredible amounts of instability there. So, theta E differential, big time capes, got enough shear there for organized convection. All, all ingredients there for potential of a forward propagating uh, mesoscale convective system. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, moving on to 4Z now. You'll notice that uh, convection had indeed fired. Uh, this, this, this convection fired as that low-level jet, jet tended to strengthen, again, into the 40 to 45 knot range or so. Uh, you're starting to get cold pool conglomeration, uh, given A, the coverage of convection there near the state line, but then it B, again, that, that great cold pool potential that we outlined with the theta E differentials there. You'll notice on that right image there, uh, the SPC slot, this is actually at the surface. You'll notice there's actually a frontal boundary also laid out that, that kind of extends from southeastern Kansas there into, into central Missouri. There's some, some pretty rich moisture present across southern Missouri that evening at surface dew points there in, in the lower 70s. Wind fields were kind of diffuse 
from southeast Kansas into southern Missouri. But again, you, you can definitely make out a frontal boundary across central Missouri there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, a 4 to the uh, 4 Z now. You, you remember what was on the rail for the Capes? Uh, STC plots at 4 Z. You still had uh, ML Capes there on the left left image. Anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000, uh, where that convection had fired, and, and immediately ahead of the convection, closer to the Springfield area. Mu K plots uh, a little bit messier. You've got pockets there, a four. 4,000 to 5,000 or so, but uh, if you really kind of blur your eyes, you can actually make out kind of a, a, a gradient, if you will, especially with the ML capes there on the left with your highest values from north central Oklahoma into northern Arkansas with more of a gradient up across central Missouri. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the, the shear plots from the SBC Mesoanalyst page. First off, uh, the left left image, your 0 6 kilometer shear vectors, bulk shear vectors. Again, looking at anywhere from roughly 30 to 40 knots or so. Enough there for definitely organized convection. Interestingly, looking at that right plot, definitely see a, a gradient there with the 0 to 1 kilometer shear vector magnitudes with the gradient running uh, fairly close, just north of the Springfield area, but you've got the bullseye of stronger shear from northeast Oklahoma into northern Arkansas there. One thing I will point out, although it, it's kind of hard to find, we don't have it in this presentation, but uh, you actually can plot the 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear vectors using the SPC Mesoanalyst graphics. Uh, if you go into the uh, SPC Composite Indices, I believe it to be right at the bottom of the menu. Look for your VGP, your 0 to 3 VGP, your vorticity generation parameter. You'll see the vectors there that pop up with that. Those are actually 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear vectors. We use those very heavily in operations here. Uh, next slide, please. This is going to be more of your, your storm relative helicity plots. Uh, again, whether you pick 0 to 1 or 0 to 3, uh, you've got a, a pr pretty strong bullseye of, of, of strong 0 to 3, 0 to 1 storm relative felicities from northeast Oklahoma. In the northern Arkansas, also got more of a gradient where that, that those cold pools are starting to conglomerate across west central Missouri there. So again, gradient north, your stronger thermo and kinematics for that matter down to the south more. Next slide. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, with the storm motion, with the SRH there, the storm relative velocity. Is yes. The motion being used, the, the storm motion of the, the system that you expect, or, you know, like using a Corfiti estimate, or is that using map uh, bunkers at all, storm motion? Yeah. That, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, being that these are from SPC, we're definitely using the, the, the bunkers right movers there. Uh, not quite sure how how uh, applicable storm relative helicities are given forecasting MCS motions or even tornado potential at that. Well, the main point we are trying to get across showing those is that your strongest shear, if you will, or at least one way to measure it, was down to the south of uh, where this MCS was developing and expected to track. Uh, we were more in the gradient region. So yeah, answer your question, it was, it was the bunkers right movers. Hey, Phil, this is Ron. We notice other cases, too, that a lot of our tonic MCS is occurring in these gradient regions, not necessarily in the bullseye. Like, for example, we had the St. Louis case um, back on December 31st, supercell case, where we see tornadoes in the bullseye region. But in this situation, we're seeing, uh, I can go back cases in the early 2000s here, doing the Batmex project and other projects, too, where I'd say the uh, tornadoes are occurring in the gradients, not so much in the bullseye. Okay, thanks, Ron. Right around 4Z here, as we uh, showed the previous SPC graphics here, just, just before 4Z here again, really starting to get the cold pools conglomerating near the state line. By this point, 
we had had uh, quite a few reports of, of straight line wind damage, I believe not only from the Wichita CWA, but ours, but also some, some pretty big hail reports, if you recall back, the, the pretty, pretty high Cape values and even high Cape values in the hail growth zone there. But one interesting uh, facet of this event is we had a, a pretty big uh, outdoor festival going on that evening. Uh, northeastern part of Springfield had about 10,000 people there, though, or so. Uh, had our, M or our WCM there actually in person providing decision support services. So a lot of communication going on between uh, Steve Runnels there and, and then the office. Obviously, a music festival, lots of people, lots of tents. They needed a, uh, advanced lead time for something that was going to be rolling in from the west. So uh, we used a lot of the techniques being uh, applied in, in, this, in this case study, in this presentation, really, to give some, some, some very high lead times for this specific event. But what we've got plotted there is your forward propagating Corvidi vectors. Again, we've already outlined, got capes well above the 2,500 threshold, uh, got great cold pool potential, got cold pool conglomeration going. If this thing were to take off and become forward propagating, you can see it's going to track off to the east in the general direction of the Show Me Music Fest there, anywhere between 35 and 45 knots or so. Next slide, please. Okay, so starting to put pieces of the puzzle together here. What's now been overlaid on top of the forward propagating corfiti vectors is your zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors. One thing that's unique about this event is you'll notice, again, assuming that thing's gonna become forward propagating and move off to the east, your zero to three kilometer shear vectors are nearly parallel to that, orientated very similarly uh, from Springfield onto the north. Just given, given a forward propagating MCS moving to the east, you, you can then imagine or picture that all right, now I've got 30 to 35 knots of the zero to three kilometer line normal bulk shear to where we're going to have mesovortex potential. So th this is a situation where you could, you could predict an hour or two hours in advance there's going to be mesovortex potential given a line moving east as long as you had line balance or a slightly uh, shear dominant system as it's accelerated off to the east. One thing I do want to point out with something, this isn't always the case. You're not always going to have those lining up like that. You go back to the super duratio, for example, your, your forward propagating corfiti vectors were more to the east-southeast. They, they work beautifully for the track of that, that super duratio, but if you recall, the zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors are off more to the northeast. But this is a great way to predict mesovortex potential in advance of a, a, a forward propagating MCS developing. Okay, we have now fast forwarded here to 432Z and you can, you can see there this thing did indeed take off, become forward propagating as it approached the, the Springfield area here. See in the, the left image there, a reflectivity, classic RIJ signature there, uh, surging in from the northwest. Notice the lower part of that reflectivity image there too. You've got outflow that's outrunning the, uh, the forward propagating MCS. You look at the orientation of the shear vectors there, that makes sense. There's very little component, um, line normal component that's available for that, so cold pool's dominating there. But get to the northern part from the apex on north, you'll notice those, those shear vectors are, you know, somewhere in your 30 to 35 knots rate uh, range, so hitting that criteria, but also orientated nearly perpendicular to that. So with this specific line coming out here, you're hitting the 30-knot criteria. You've got a balanced region, perhaps could argue maybe a slightly shear dominant region there. The criteria was there to, to get the mesovortices, and they indeed did start developing, actually even before this, just to the west of Greenfield there. So started getting that, that wavy look to the line there with, with the mesovortex genesis. You can see uh, the arrow there on the, the right image, the velocity image, pointing out one of those mesovortices that is actually just about to produce a tornado. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, moving on to 443 here. Again, 
continues to approach uh, the Springfield area, the Music Fest outflow continues to separate from the southern southern flank of that MCS. Uh, still got very very favorable zero to three kilometer vector orientation from the apex on north. Notice there, not only do you have the one mesovortex uh, with the arrow there on the right image, and this, this is producing a tornado right around this time, you've also got another one that's starting to develop. It's kind of hard to see, uh, perhaps for you all, but it's kind of to the east-northeast of Greenfield. They're pretty close to the county line. Now, the difference between these two mesovortices is the southern one, which produced a tornado, was on the leading edge. The one up north was actually tucked back into the stratiform precipitation region. One other feature I want to do, I do want to point out, maybe again hard to see, but if you look at that southern mesovortex, if you look at the reflectivity there, you kind of almost notice a right angle where that outflow boundary, that outflow comes up intersects the line in that balanced region there, real close to the arrow, kind of got that kink going on there. That, that's, a, that's a feature we've noticed uh, with quite a few of these is MCS tornadoes. Some refer to it as a front end nub, but uh, very classic feature that we've noticed when these things develop along the leading edge there of, of an MCS. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, these next few are going to be animations, so we'll cross our fingers and hope they, they come across. But the uh, main thing we really want to point out with the animations, it's an absolutely great tool. Uh, radar operators, maybe an assistant or a meso analyst, maybe you got GR analysts fired up somewhere on a PC, but a very great tool to depict evolution. Uh, How is this MCS evolving? Where is that balanced region going to track over the next 30, 30 minutes to an hour or so. You know, where's that greatest potential for mesovorts going to track over the next 35 to 40 minutes? Because I've got to potentially reissue another tornado warning. So definitely be looking at the animations. would highly recommend a radar procedure to uh, utilizing the zero to three kilometer shear vectors. It's going to help, help radar operators, mesoanalysts out immensely to show where is that balance region potentially going to track? And again, mesovortex development, given the shear, uh, line normal shear magnitudes. Uh, you can go ahead and move forward to the next slide. Uh, similar to this one, but it's going to be your velocities. Again, you're asking yourself the same types of questions. Uh, looking at the velocities there, is this thing surging out? Yeah, you, you got an apex surging out. Is there so much research out there, including uh, tons of Ron's research there. Apex of the bow on north, uh, favorite area for tornado genesis, mesovortex genesis. So definitely, definitely want to use the, the animations. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to load so well. I'll go ahead and move on to the hey, next. Jason? Yes. Real quick, on this case, how, how, how long was the tornado track? That's actually going to be the next slide here. Um, Okay, I see it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it hasn't. Okay, got it here now. Yeah, I actually had three tornadoes with that system, that MCS there. Uh, you'll notice the longest track there, uh, tracked over the far northwest part of Greene County, it was on the ground for a decent amount of time uh, for, for a, a mesovortex tornado there. And notice it was rated an EF1. That was at that southern mesovortice. You'll notice the northern one. Again, that was tucked back more in the stratiform precipitation region. Um, actually had a, a one with that. The point, the one was actually right at the end of that. But again, that one, that one was not going to be visible. It was tucked into the stratiform precipitation region. It also had a third touchdown uh, very close to the county line there, a little bit further to the east. Uh, one thing that's not shown on this graphic, we had a, another funnel cloud report a bit further to the east off of this graphic. Are there any questions um, with, with this case, the super duratio? Because what I'm going to do is shortly here is pass this off to Ron. He's actually going to pick up this case 
uh, from a St. Louis CWA perspective. So are there any questions regarding the first half of this case or, or the super ratio or anything for that matter up to this point? Well, Ron, it's cricket, so it's yours, buddy. Thank you very much, Jason. Okay, we're going to look at this case from the St. Louis perspective. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I think our greatest challenges we've seen across our CWA, I guess over the past even 10, 12 years, is having these uh, late night events occurring and uh, uh, we see mental vortices, uh, sometimes not well defined, uh, and they, we see uh, snail track um, occurring and possibly the range of damage could be from EF1 up to EF2. If we go on the next slide here, I think we'll see, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of the SPC medical analysis from this perspective here first, and then we'll go into the radio analysis second. So next slide, please. There we go. So this is the 0 6 kilometer shear vectors. Again, notice that uh, the actual uh, vectors here, uh, this layer was around 40, 45 knots, steep in the crossings for our region here. And again, the actual storms are northeast of Springfield here in southwest of St. Louis. So if you would kind of look at maybe somewhat two-thirds the way down from St. Louis, one-third to the northeast of Springfield, we're going to pick up from that location there. That's where we we found our MCS at that point there. Uh, next slide. Okay. Again, I mentioned earlier that uh, this is a zero one kilometer shear vector to the left and zero one kilometer sorry, let's see, to the right. Uh, note that the, the strongest magnitudes are still in southwest Missouri, uh, and uh, yet the convection, you know, the MCS is in that gradient region. And again, I noticed this in other cases too. That's what's kind of interesting. Now, I mean, you may have cases out there that says, uh, gee, Ron, we got stuff in the bullseye, and that's a possibility. But what we're seeing here is that uh, usually the tenial genesis occurring in, in that gradient region, and usually along a surface boundary too. There's that surface boundary that kind of extended across uh, western Kentucky up into uh, south central Missouri here, and at the MCS trailed on to the east here. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is also an example of ML cape and also MU cape here. And uh, values here did range uh, as high as uh, 3,500 joules per kilogram over uh, southeast Missouri, with the, act, with the highest axis extent to the southwest of ML cape. And then UK values will also range around uh, 3,000, 3,500 as well. So again, uh, surface boundary was just north, somewhere to the north of this area across the south of St. Louis here and uh, also further on to the west here. It's all you guys can see was to our south of the surface boundary here. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, my rendition of this case. Now we're seeing a more of a line normal component to the MCS here. Uh, we have some convection exchange to the north and east. I kind of superimposed uh, likely to some kind of surface boundary that extended onto the north and east uh, from uh, the actual line itself extended to the portion of the line. And note the line basically is pretty linear in fashion here. We don't see much bowing occurring at this particular time. I do see, uh, I know I can draw my little arrows, I can point out where the Mexican rim flow jet might be impinging on the western flank of this line. Uh, particularly, if you uh, look at the town of, uh, uh, if you look across portions of, uh, I'd say, Crawford County here, we have Cook Station here, and so for Rollins to our north, and uh, again, the, the actual uh, uh, Rear and flow jets, you know, Mexican rear and flow jets impinging on the west flank here. So, but note the gradient is very tight along the leading edge here. So you got a very strong uh, updraft, downdraft interface. I've seen this so many times in other cases that uh, this is an area for geneogenesis to occur. In this very strong interface. We see a balance again occurring between the probably the amateur and the and the system copal here, basically what Jason talked about here and so forth. Um, next slide, please. 
At 653, uh, now we're seeing a little bit of bowing occurring here. Again, that's probably near the apex of the bowl structure. And note the uh, rainfall knots against those, so they're pretty good. Service boundary, some kind of service boundary may extend onto the east northeast from this point. And if we continue uh, to the next slide here. Yeah, next slide, please. Here we go. At 0701, uh, basically, it does, uh, the actual bow echo does show up quite nicely. Now it's blowing out quite nicely at this point. At this time, there is a tornado on the ground uh, just to the north and west of Cherryville, Missouri. You see the town of Cherryville there. And it's in that gradient region there. And I don't know if you can depict it, but uh, the animation, if you, uh, you can see a little bit of a bright inbound velocity maximum along that leading edge, uh, but the outbound velocity maximum doesn't show up that well. This is almost like a tornado cyclone, and we're looking at ranges up around 135 kilometers away from the radar at this point here. So it, uh, we were unable, you know, we had a serious thunderstorm warning now, and uh, this thing did cause some uh, pretty substantial damage to a couple farmsteads and also a, uh, a, a two, uh, one-story residential home. And actually the home basically, uh, the whole top, you know, except for a few walls standing, the roof was displaced over a quarter mile to the north, northeast, while most of the walls of the home uh, were displaced onto the east, northeast. Uh, we had four injuries at this home, and uh, like I say, they would take the nearby hospital in Rolla, Missouri, for lacerations and so forth. And uh, you can see the animation there going on. This, this is looking pretty good there. There we go. You can see that little mini, uh, that little guy there that's moving across uh, north of Cherryville and south of Steelville, Missouri. And that uh, was the one that spawned uh, this tunnel. And we rated it EF2 uh, due to the home damage and also the farm structural damage uh, further on to the south and west. Um, this uh, was a short track tornado. It didn't last that long. I think if you go to the next slide here. And then I kind of point out the location in more detail. There we go. And I did draw two tornado tracks. And there's the beginning of that little mini, little tornado cyclone structure. Very small core diameter. And uh, like I say, uh, to my surprise, I haven't seen something like this. Oh goodness! Last time I saw something like this, this small was up um, was February, I think, 28, 1999, northwest of St. Louis. Here we had a cold season event that occurred, but this thing, uh, like I say, did show up, and um, it's very hard to really uh, find these little small circ intense circulations. Um, but one thing you can look at: so north of the apex, along the leading edge, and maybe just a little further south of the axial surface boundary. This is the VR trace for, I call it Tineo Cyclone 1 here. And you can see the magnitudes and these are meters per second. They're not that strong. This is, uh, again, we have some beam width issues here, aspect ratio issues where we're not sampling well at these further distances for these small circulations. That's just a known problem with the radar characteristics. So, but magnitudes were basically, you know, 10 meters per second, 11 meters per second strongest rotation was at low levels there, but still well below most of the cases I sampled in the early, early cases I sampled uh, throughout the 2000s here and, and the 1990s. Next slide. Okay, and this is the damage track of the actual tornado tracks. I know I'm an old timer, sorry about that, but I do go into uh, a little bit of Fragile-like type damage patterns showing where the downburst winds were. And most of the damaging downburst winds, uh, straight line winds, were near the apex of the bow itself and even south of the apex of the bow, which, you know, one would expect. And the tornado track was just north of the apex of the bow there. It started with EF0 and then it did climb up to EF1, EF2, and then went dropped down to EF0 here. And then we don't see much, as I cross Highway 19 out there, there wasn't much uh, signal there. Uh, weak EF0. But this is an example that in uh, a lot of cases uh, we come across, we see a tornado track not, you know, could be near the apex or just north of the apex of the bow echo. This is a favorite location 
And uh, even with a larger organized system, sometimes these uh, mesovortices can basically extend for a long period of time, over 40, 50 minutes, and uh, spawn multiple tenails near the apex of the bow echo. Uh, this is a favorite region. I want to really stress this point very much, that uh, near and north of the apex of the bow echo is the prime spot I look at a lot of times uh, for multiple tenail touch sounds to occur and uh, long-lived mesovortices. In this case, this didn't really happen. This is Nolan Atkins' uh, schematic diagram, uh, Atkins and St. Lawrence, from 2009 paper in, in what, a monthly weather review. And basically, what they show is that the cold pool basically uplifts the warm air, and that's what causes our vortex tubes to rise, basically. And we see our cyclonic member uh, to the north and a cyclonic member to the south. And uh, this is probably about the most uh, uh, I'd say probably uh, one of the more recognized conceptual models in Merkle simulations that no one has shown here, basically. And you may have two or three of these little guys along large convective lines here, but uh, again, uh, we're in flow jet, you know, the actual downdraft rear inflow jet structure does cause this lifting of the moist air from the east here in this situation, east to northeast. And uh, again, the vorticity vector point to the south, we see our cyclone vortex member evolving uh, to the northern part and then anticlonic on the southern part. In reality, we don't see too many of the uh, anticlonic vortices. You may come across one or two, but mostly the cyclonic member is the most preferred and known uh, vortex that you will find, uh, like, say, uh, like say, with these uh, systems here. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, this is one of the Nolan's earlier conceptual model. Uh, this is probably just after BAMX. We were outside with Nolan about this, and this is after BAMX, and we came across cases where we did have uh, tenails uh, with one of our cases, uh, the June 10, 2003 event, where we had more than one tenail touchdown occurring, and one was uh, seen near the apex or just north of the apex, and that second one was a little further north, and as you can see, uh, the primary damage threat was really north of the apex of the bow echo there in this case as we go to the bow echo stage. And then, like I say, we see the comma echo stage. This is a revision of Dr. Fujita's uh, uh, earlier conceptual model on bow echo evolution. So this was, was devised, uh, devised during, uh, just after the VAMIX project and other cases that we looked at back in the 1990s. And the next slide. This is a updated conceptual model from, uh, again, uh, uh, Atkins and St. Laurent, 2009. This is also a monthly weather review paper. And he does kind of, uh, no one does point out the descending rear flow jet structure. And he knows that the greatest damaging mesovortex threat would just be near and north of the apex. And uh, again, this is for individual bow echo that would be evolving to the east here. Um, if you have a larger line, you know, extending across, you may come across two or three uh, preferred regions near, uh, not only near the apex, but also north of the apex of the bow echo there, uh, where we see actual tenogenesis that might be occurring. But uh, primary damaging winds would be from maybe apex southward. Uh, Jason showed an excellent example of the, two th of the actual uh, super derecho case where the line was normal to the shear vectors, and we really don't expect much in the way of, you know, I have a long-lived mesovortex evolution down there. Uh, we don't expect much in the way of, you know, tenial genesis to occur in the southern part of the line down there because, again, the shear vector is being parallel to the actual, uh, being parallel to the actual uh, uh, line down there and so forth. So our prime interest is from the apex and northward and these cases here. This is a conceptual model by Brian Klamowski, and I was involved with uh, working with him on, and this is one of his cases, again, showing the surface uh, convection extending northeast from the bow echo. Uh, you see a surface boundary like this convection extending to the northeast, uh, demarcating likely a surface boundary with the main bow echo to the south and west here. And you can see this is a forward propagating system with enhanced stratiform precipitation along the train flank of the bow echo in this situation. Our, if we had tenogenesis to occur, then likely would be from the apex northward uh, towards the intersection there. Okay, next slide, please. I kind of did some uh, revisions on 
my original conceptual ideas that passes on to no one, just some thoughts and ideas here. And uh, we've got a number of cases that we see uh, a service boundary interacting, could be an old outflow boundary, interacting with the convective line in the northern portion. And often our first two reservoirs, excuse me, form near this uh, inter uh, intersection area. And then uh, we may see another mesovortex forming right near the center of the line uh, in this fashion. That's the, uh, um, the left, uh, upper left schematic and the right, lower right schematic that show the more of the, the bell type stage evolution where we see the evolution of a bookend vortex here in the north, uh, line intersection going on uh, essentially you know, to the northeast there with uh, one mesovortex near the intersection and a second mesovortex south of there. Now, again, you may have two or three, uh, it's a possibility, but uh, in these kind of larger scale systems, I expect uh, you know, pretty good longevity of the mesovortex. So we can go back to several cases in the 1990s, June 29th, 1998. I can go back to 2004 case, um, 2002 case here, and uh, the mesovortex lifetimes were around 60 minutes. And in the path length, uh, like say, uh, uh, can be as large as uh, of these actual mesovortices can be as large as uh, 100 kilometers here. Uh, genetic damage paths can uh, have various path lengths. They can be very short, like we saw in the June 19th case here, and, uh, and yet they can have pretty large, larger path lengths of four you know, miles. Again, the damage intensity will probably likely be between EF0 and EF2, and uh, uh, for some reason, my, uh, warm season night cases, or even in the transition season, those night cases we come across EF2 damage, and it, this kind of puzzles me as why uh, we're getting these, uh, you know, I'd say with the, uh, these EF2 uh, damage, I can go back to about four or five cases here, and uh, so we're still going to do a lot more investigation on some of these little nighttime, early morning event cases here, and this is a rough time here, so. so uh, this other case, I'm working with Steve Ambrin, uh, the Suez Tulsa here, and this is just some early thoughts and some observations. Um, uh, a complex uh, that formed in the early morning hours around zero, zero 09 Zulu uh, boetical case, the surface boundary, outflow boundary intersected in the northern part of the line, a large boetical. And I get similar to Brian's work, my work here a little bit, that we uh, looked at in the 1990s. Uh, next slide. I got some radar imagery showing uh, the actual uh, uh, fields of 500 millibars, a deep trough to our west of us, and well, I'm always in stable air to our east. Uh, I'm over us, basically, over central and southern plains here in this case. I kind of shaded the green there showing that thing, boy, 16 degrees Celsius dew point in a shaded green region of uh, this particular event. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a signing from, uh, from uh, Norman at zero Z. And uh, ML case, in this case, were about 2,500 joules, just about 2,500 joules per kilogram. The 06 kilometer shear was around uh, 57 knots. And ML sin was uh, about one, uh, negative 176 joules per kilogram. Uh, I, I, am, uh, I did request from Steve Weiss and from uh, Joe Guy to help us out to get some SPC mesoscale analysis data for this case, and I should be receiving that uh, shortly for this event. So next slide is going to be a little mini composite of, uh, of uh, several reflectivity and velocity slides. And again, here's a situation where outflow, uh, this outflow boundary from the convection to the north extended northeast, southwest, and intersected almost the center portion of the bow echo, at least of the evolving and developing bow echo structure in this case. Okay, oh, there you go. And uh, what's interesting in this case is you can see how, uh, and also the following slides coming up here, you can see how the reflectivity structure is kind of elongated in certain portion of the line down there. And that's kind of indicating that the winds are very, very strong in this particular event where the, actually we see a lot of uh, the convective cells basically being overwhelmed by the intense cold pool. Uh, and while in the northern portion, we see more of a balance occurring near the eighth, near the intersection, north of the intersection right there. And we do have a little weakness of vortex developing 
uh, south of the uh, intersection. This is uh, taken at 0946, the second image here. Now we're seeing several images of vortices in MV4. You see they're off to uh, to north here. This is near, this is near and south the intersection of MV1. And there's other vortices along this entire line, but as you go further south here, uh, basically it's just uh, very intense wind damage. Uh, note how the echoes are elongating in structure, and this kind of indicates that the COPU has really dominated that part of the line, and I don't expect much in the way of mesovortex evolution except for some very intense damaging winds to occur. While uh, if you go for the northern portion of the line here, this is where we see our mesovortex development to, uh, to occur. Uh, next slide. At, uh, one, we got two more slides here coming up. Here we go, 950 again. Uh, Note, again, uh, how the echoes are almost being torn apart. You know, I hate to use that phrase, but, but look, look, look how the displays down the south there, away from the leading edge here particularly. Um, definitely the Kopu is a, a, a very dominant force in this particular case down here. Well, uh, more mesovortex evolution is occurring where we see, do see some uh, convection along the leading edge of the line, and we do see that uh, intersection occurring uh, just near MV4 at that point there. And I got a close-up view at 0954 showing the location MV4, MV3, MV1. And uh, you do see like the little concavities in the reflectivity pattern. You know, Jason talked about this wavy line structure, and we do see that in this little case here that uh, most of the vortices are forming, you know, kind of like in this uh, concavity, just south the concavity region or just basically uh, north of where the, maybe uh, the wind flow is very intense and so forth. And MV4 became the strongest of all the mesovortices in this case. And what was kind of interesting was that the strongest rotational velocities, I don't have the plots with me on this presentation, but uh, some initial plots that we were working on, VR trace plots, showed that the strongest rotation was in the lowest one-half kilometer of the mesovortex depth. Actually, MV4, early on and during this time, the entire depth was around 2.5 kilometers deep. And that's not very deep at all. It's kind of considered if you're trying to look at these systems at distant ranges from the radar. But uh, that was the strongest one. And before it was the one that caused EF2 damage and moved uh, along and south of I-44. It caused uh, damage to several homes uh, in some residential regions uh, along I-44 and south of I-44 down there. So. So with, this is a working study on this case here, and uh, we're going to probably present a paper at the upcoming SOS conference on this particular event. So anyway, in summary, we looked at kind of like three different scenario QLCS cases. Um, first case was the brief overview of the May 8th super derecho event, and when applying the 3 kilometer shear vectors overlaid on reflectivity imagery, we see basically you know, uh, the vectors were nearly you know, perpendicular to the line or I would say maybe there might be a 10, 15, or 20 degree offset there, but still that's well within reason there. And uh, again, most of the tenial, uh mesovortices form near the apex of the bell in this particular case. Second event, uh, we viewed the June 19th, 1819th, the late night case again, uh, with the zero two kilometer shear vector supplied. And uh, this is a very challenging case for us uh, from the chaos X perspective, where uh, again, it's very, Tight, small tenial cyclone formed just near north of the apex there and, and south of the uh, intersection of the uh, surface boundary. And uh, again, uh, it only lasted for a brief period of time, and the total length of the damage was roughly about, I think, four miles at most. So we do come across these tough cases, and, you know, there's just practically no weed time and those type of events there. It's just really tough uh, to gather. And why they occur in the early morning hours is really... Uh, kind of intriguing. I was, we're just going to do a lot more work in this area. Uh, we have other cases that occurred in the early morning hours, too, uh, that spawned EF2. Uh, at, at today, it's caused EF2 damage. So it, it's, uh, this is a challenging area that we're going to uh, see what we can come across here. And the la last slide here, one more slide here we have, I believe. Here we go. Uh, yeah, uh, the final case occurred on, the, actually we had two more slides, I'm sorry. Uh, the final case occurred on uh, 13 May 2010 over the WFL Tulsa CWA. Uh, 
and yeah, okay, we and Jason and I looked at the shear vectors, and they were quite uh, perpendicular. We didn't get a chance to show this on our presentation, but they were nearly perpendicular to the convective line in this case, particularly near north of the apex of the bow echo. And uh, we also introduced some earlier conceptual and latest conceptual model thinking with you know, QLCSs. Again, I've been working with Noah Atkins a little bit on this issue here. And uh, we want to do some uh, surveying with Dupol, particularly the uh, our CC uh, from mesovortex at distant ranges, how well we can the, pick up the debris field. You know, actually, actually the uh, uh, signal off of CC here, how well can we detect it at these farther ranges from the radar. And I got one last slide here coming up. Potential for mesovortex development is, uh, again, is the increase with environmental shear and copal, the other imbalance here, or slightly shear dominant. And again, uh, we're looking at that 15 meter per second within this layer, 30 knots or greater. And I've got, I have cases dating back, way back in the early 1990s, around 1993, uh, 1992, 1994, that shows that 15 meter per second or greater was the one of the thresholds. I just looked at magnitudes. I really don't get the sure effect, but at least the magnitudes at that point. I know other offices have been looking at this magnitude as well, the zero three kilometer magnitude. And so it's good to see these independent studies occurring at other CW other offices uh, besides uh, here in St. Louis. So and that kind of concludes our presentation. So I think Jason and I would be happy to entertain any questions. Ron, one thing I wanted I failed to point out earlier uh, since the theme has been the late night, early morning cases, is if you can remember back to the, the shear cold pool balance schematics, uh, the, the actual one that showed the balance, uh, one of the key components to that, uh, again, with the, the con constructive interference between the, the cold pool and the environmental shear is the ability for the updraft to be, be much taller and, and that, that really comes into play late at night early morning when you're trying to overcome an LFC downstream right 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 any questions hey Ron I have a couple questions please um, yeah it's kind of two um, two different types of questions the first and um, you speak to um, like a variant of uh, QLCS tornadogenesis. What I've seen on cases, especially here uh, in the Pleasant Hill area, and maybe um, is kind of um, essentially we get storms, uh, you know, supercell activity going out uh, on in central western Kansas, and uh, through evolution, uh, storm evolution, it's basically. Um, the conservation of storm scale vorticity where some of that supercell activity out there in western Kansas actually morphs into first a bow echo and then a QLCS. And that seems to be often the genesis of uh, many of our QLCS tornado uh, genesis cases. Um, and I kind of noticed that in your June 19th case. I, I, I think that one, that storm up by um, Steelville might have been a, a supercell at one time. Um, can you speak to that? Has, have you seen that quite often? Uh, not too often. Uh, the, the only case I'm, you know, that we have, we do have supercells in some of the line cases, particularly in the cold season uh, events. Uh, a good example would be that December 31st case Fred Glass is working on. Uh, with Jim Seavey King, uh, there were some supercells, but they only lasted for maybe one or two volume scans like, you know, they weren't long-lived supercells, they were short-lived supercells, because they were constantly, uh, the reflectivity is constantly changing, evolving basically, and so, uh, and we also have, I think they have also a couple other uh, uh, supercell events, a couple other supercells and other cold season events. Uh, We've been looking at further across the uh, southern portion of the uh, central region CWA. But uh, most of our cases, uh, like so you saw Jason's reflectivity pattern, and uh, you, you've seen ours here. Uh, like I say, uh, the only thing I can recall is the, the super derecho case where, yeah, we did uh, the shear, uh, shear profile did change. We saw more supercellular structure. Uh, with line convection, uh, as the line was moving just out of the uh, moving in the west, east, far eastern portion of the Springfield County Warren area, and moving into our western south 
southwest portion of our CWA. And, but that was only for a brief period of time there. And there were tornadoes. We had one tornado that uh, caused, I believe, EF2 damage in Reynolds County, which is in the south central portion of Missouri. Uh, one of the super cells, Mark Britt, gave that presentation at the last uh, cervical storm conference. And, uh, but uh, like I say, um, um, most of the cases I look at is really line, just solid line convection. And uh, you see the multi, typical multi cell evolution. You know, if you go back to the papers by Howes and Brad Small, you know, we're talking about 1980s now. I'm, I'm not, I know I'm going back in my time here, but you go back to those fundamental papers, basically, and they do show basically line convection, and that's what we're seeing. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I get real worried sometimes. Are people mixing multi cell evolution with supercell? You know what I'm saying? And is the supercell lasting for an extended period of time? Is there persistence? Go back to Chuck Doswell's paper back in 1990, preprint paper. He talks about persistence, you know, about supercell longevity issues here and so forth. Um, you just, you know, we do see those structures out there, but in the cold season, but they're for a more of a brief period of time, I think. Does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Well, no, not really, but that's okay. Well, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's more, I've just seen it uh, more often than not, just like it's almost a conservation of storm scale vorticity that eventually action that's going on, it morphs into QLCS tornado genesis. And I've seen that more often than once, and it might be more of a modeling study that's required or uh, in order to capture this. But anyway, um, my second question has to do with... Um, uh, radar detection. Um, I noticed that you were focusing just on uh, velocity and reflectivity. Have you ever looked at spectrum width, um, given sometimes you get some de-aliasing problems going on with the velocity um, and just the kind of the small nature of those mesovortices to kind of track those features? Yes, I do. Yeah, uh, Ray Worf has done quite a bit of work on this. I still look at uh, spectrum width as well in some of the cases here. Uh, I will use it only for short ranges near the radar itself. I won't go much beyond, you know, I'd say 35, 40 nautical miles out there. Um, but I do look at it in short range. I know Pat's going looked at it as well. Now, maybe they have cases that they've looked beyond 40 nautical miles from the radar, particularly, or 35 nautical miles away. But uh, I've looked at the spectrum width as another tool, along with velocity information. So I'm always looking at. My, I'm always asking myself, okay, where is that vortex going to form? Okay, and I think it's contribution from the mid rainfall jet. It's contribution, maybe it's a, if it's a nearby surface boundary. It's contribution from that feature there. Uh, some local vorticity from the surface boundary. Uh, no inaccuracy is coming around with the surface boundary issue in recent years. Am I been talking about this? Um, for example, the Tulsa case, the strongest tornado occurred. Uh, with that middle vortex to the north, where the surface boundary is intersecting that part of that of that line there, and that's why the other tornadoes uh, 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 the damage is weaker, basically south of that uh, that middle vortex where that line intersection occurred. And uh, so, um, I'm always you know I'm always in real time. I'm thinking conceptual models in my mind real time and helping out to warn forecasters. And this is the preferred region and. We've been looking at a lot of cases here, and boy, I tell you, more cases I look at, and near north of the apex, that's a hot spot. And, and, and you know, maybe we have different, uh, this, you know, different regimes, you know, deeper moisture in this part of the country versus what's on the high plains out there and, and uh, so forth. And uh, I'd say, um, I'm just going to say that, yeah, that's just, you know, some of our disease last, uh, these mesovortices can have lifetimes over 60 minutes. So, and they can spawn two or three tornadoes uh, within a lifetime there. So, it's, I just don't think it's always just a short lifetime for, you know, Mr. Vortex comes and dies. It does happen, like in this June 19th case. But we have other cases with more organized uh, line convection where the Mr. Vortex is a long-lasting uh, feature and, again, can spawn two or three tornadoes possibly. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ron and uh, Jason, for this uh, great uh, presentation today on QLCS tornadoes.
Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you have any more questions, uh, well, you know where to get hold of Ron or Jason both. Thank you, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.